Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Y'all ain't even ready for our guest today. She is a self-made CEO and advocate for women, Cindy Eckert. I'm so excited. I have <clears throat> Cindy too. Eckert today on the podcast. And I think it's um, really, how long have we known each other now? I was thinking about that. Is three it three years? years? That's what I thought. And um, do you want to you tell people how we met? Oh, I'm happy to. Okay, <laughs> go for it. I think it's really interesting. I can tell. I can say tell, from my perspective. Okay, start. You start. I'll, you can do I tell yours the whole story? And I'll do mine. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I was Glamour Woman of the Year um, three years ago. Yes. I think it was three years ago. I and I had right. a Barbie and the whole oh, thing. Oh, I loved it. Yes. And um, and there was an auction on eBay, and you could buy time with me, and which I I had never done before, and I never even like thought that that was like something that somebody would want to purchase. And I told Glamour, I was like, sure, let's do it. Let's see. Let's see what weirdos come out of the woodwork. (laughs) And next thing you know, they're like, oh yeah, this woman named Cindy bought you. I was like, (laughs) really? Yeah, right. Bought your time. And I think that, was it set up what we were going to do before? Or was it like, did we already kind of dictate it? You guys dictated it. Yes. Okay. So we did a full on photo shoot. Yes. And then we were supposed to work out at my gym. And after, so first of all, we had the bombshell photo shoot. Yes. And I got Cindy in her bra. (laughs) I got her to shake her titties. Well, in your bra part of the time. Yes. Yes, that was true. I almost got down to my skivvies. I almost got you there, but we're in jeans. You can Google it. It's really hot. (laughs) And then, and then we were supposed to go work out. And I said, do you really want to work out? And you kind of were like, you shook your head Mm -hmm. no. Next thing you know, we went downstairs and went straight to Shake Shack, had burger fries. I don't think we had Coke. I think we had like water maybe. Yes. And you told me your whole story. And I was enamored because I had no idea, because I had no idea who I was meeting that day. Yeah, sure. And you were like, yeah, I'm this lady who, <laughs> this lady, who sold my company for a billion dollars. And I want to be, I want to be a part of your business and I want to be an advocate for you. Yeah. And I thought in that moment, who bought this time? Did I buy this time or did you buy this time? Oh, because it was like, it was honestly, it was a blessing. It was truly because you've been such a blessing. And I think that what you do and you stand up for women and you advocate for women in business is very mm-hmm. important because I've heard you say so much that you haven't had female mentorship. And yeah. it's been very <clears throat> difficult for me to find it as well mm-hmm. in certain avenues. So that's how we met. That's I my know. story. That is per- I, it's perfect. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just, I'll proceed that by saying I had seen you speak at Forbes Women. That's right. I thought you were outstanding. Then I was literally invited to go to Glamour Women of the Year. I was at the ceremony where you were being awarded and this announcement was made and I'm like, I want to spend time with Ashley. Who doesn't want to spend time with Ashley? Never thinking that it would play out that way and and truly like such a gift to get to see that you are exactly as you appear. Like, I say that to people all the time. They ask me, what's Ashley like? And I'm like, what you see is what you get. Yeah. There is there is no <laughs> fakery in that. And I think that's so refreshing. I love what you do for women. Thank you. Yeah, well, it, it it's a very unique story and I'm so glad that we get to yeah, share it too. with everybody. And I got to see what it's like to go to Shake Shack as a model. Oh my where gosh. Where everybody comes around, they're like, Ash, would you, would you like anything else? It all of a sudden became like a full service restaurant. Like they came up and they're like, more fries? Would you like a shake? Would you like this? We got some free yeah. fries or something. Not me, you did. Oh. <laughs> Just to be clear. Just ah. Oh my God goodness so and also how's your podcast going good it's good good. you know it's similarly I feel so fortunate to have like I say colorful characters in my Mm -hmm. life Mm -hmm. and I hear these great stories of success and how they got there and it's really like I just want people to have a moment listening into our conversation so um, you know, you got to make time for it. So yeah. I've got to make time for it. The business has been crazy this year. I know. I'm excited to talk yeah. about it. And something else that I just realized, too, is I, I didn't realize that you had moved around every single oh, yeah. year of your life, which I thought was interesting. I've lived in six different states, yeah. but you've lived in 12. That's right. I think I've lived in overseas twice. I think I, I stopped counting at 32 moves. Oh. But ever, the most, like every single year from the fourth grade through my senior year of high school, I changed schools. 
Oh, my. So perpetual new kid. So what's the good thing about that, and what's the bad <laughs> thing about that? Um, so the bad thing was, at that moment in time, like, you left and you were out. Mm. Like, there was no, we weren't going to email each other or anything there else. There was no I Facebook. The Fiji Islands I lived in when I was a little girl, so you know I wasn't long distance calling back to Fiji, my group of friends. So that's the sad thing, is lost connections in some way. But the great thing is you get really comfortable being the perpetual outsider. Because mm -hmm. when you show up as a new kid in school, like you are not going to be popular. You're not going to be the cool kid. And it really, I think, teaches you to sit on the outside of the room and observe everything that's going on. And I think it's given me a lot of fearlessness in taking on things as an outsider. Do you think that that fearlessness you've kind of learned to twist into your businesses? For sure. Is that kind of where the love of business came about? You know, I grew up, so this is such a ridiculous story, but I grew up in Rochester, New York, like <laughs> wrong side of the tracks, like little neighborhood, you're either Irish or you're Italian. And every Sunday, my family went to Wegmans. This Wegmans. Is where I get super weird. So I'm like we didn't a have cult Wegmans. follower of Wegmans. I heard about this. Like, it's it's a little it's crazy. disturbing. But, but you talk to people, and like, it has a cult following. And I think from a little girl, I've always loved, like, what makes a business tick? I tease that my big, I have two big brothers, and they would tell you that every game I played as a child was with me as a CEO, which really was just them manipulating me because they would make me have CK's Kitchen, Cindy Karen, um, and it was so that I would go and deliver things to them on the couch from the refrigerator. It was actually the only way they'd play with me. Come on. Because <laughs> you're the baby. They're such turds, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Wait, it's three kids. Three. You're the baby. I'm the baby. Two I, big I'm, brothers. I, I, I know you very personally, yeah. and... On the outside, you're yeah. this like very like well put together. Yeah. I wear pink. I have a pink <laughs> lipstick. I have my hair done. But y'all, she is a badass. <laughs> like she'll curse or she'll be like, no, you fucking deserve something. <laughs> it's just like that's Cindy. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because you have two older brothers. It I'm is. Sure. Oh my god, that memo of like you got to protect your younger sister did not get it. Like they thought their job was to toughen me up for the world. And to this day, they like, did a good job. They're just. They did a yeah. really good job. So is it Wegmans that actually inspired you? The ridiculousness of that story is I think it started a pattern where I was like weirdly obsessed with what make companies work. And then I think that if you factor that in with this like really unusual childhood of being this outsider, mm -hmm. sort of like as I started to look at business when everybody else was running away, it was my signal to run in. Mm -hmm. And I became fearless in taking on the things that nobody else would take on. And to me, they were so obvious. Like pharmaceuticals. Well, like female Viagra. Yeah, like <laughs> seriously. Because there's 26 drugs for men, but not a single one for women. I can't wait to start talking about this, but I want to start, I want to give, I want to kind of do chronologically yeah. so people know how yeah. you got here. Because sure. it's not like one day you woke up and you were like, no. hey, you know what? I'm not really feeling like having sex. Like, that's really not even the for story. Sure. So I had a professor who like knew this obsession of mine with businesses. Okay. So she would make me do an extra project where I would read about companies and report Report, like what made them great. So we had like a side project. I would, you know, read all the magazines and come in and tell her. And through that, honest to God, I made a decision. I'm going to work for Fortune's most admired company. It was it. Didn't matter what industry it was in or anything else. Like I'm going to go learn from the best. And when I, at the time, that best was Merck, which was a pharmaceutical company. And I was hellbound and determined I'm hired by Merck. And I think my professor got a little freaked out. She was like, yeah, you should probably send your resume out to a couple places. I'm like, Merck. And I got the job. And that's really what started it. Wow, tunnel so vision. So it was like, I want to be with the best. I want to learn from the best. And I think the surprise for me was that I fell in love with the science. Interesting. How long were you at Merck? Four years. Is Merck where you got the idea to start? Mm -mm. Oh. No. It, Merck was the, the training ground that said, holy shit, I can't be in a big environment. Like, mm -hmm. I need to be heard. I need them to do it my way. And I was very clear very quickly uh, that they were Fortune's Most Admired because they had a great PR department. <laughs> and, and I was a number. And it it was going to take me a long time to be heard. And so I made this crazy decision to go to what at the time was a startup. Right. Like way back before that was cool. Before startups were like the thing to be a yeah. part of. Okay, so this is a question that I've heard you ask a lot of yeah. people. And so I want to flip it back yeah. on you. And it's what was the first way that you ever thought about making money? 
Oh, yeah. Or I, how did you ever first start making money? This is a question you ask a lot of people okay. that you hire. Honest, I do. I always ask that question. And can I tell a story first about somebody I just hired? Please. So so it was great because I was asking her this question, how did you ever make money? And she said, you know, like, oh, I was a babysitter. And she started telling, great. And then she's like, but that's not really the first way I made money. I'm like, ooh, tell me. And she said, well, when I was really little, my mom had a garden and she would pick all the tomatoes and put them in a pretty basket and ask me to take them to the neighbors. She's like, but when I got there, I sold them. <laughs> and I was like, hired. Hustler. <laughs> hired. Oh, my God. Love it, right? So how's she doing in the company? Number one salesperson. <laughs> and, and I call her, I nickname everybody, so her nickname is Heirloom oh. for the tomatoes. And, like, that, it says so much to me about, like, scrappiness, mm -hmm. right? Like, when are you starting to want to own it for yourself? It, at least to work in my companies, you got to love that ownership piece. I think my earliest days money was probably uh, hustling my brothers. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> so, a good hustle. It's a good hustle. Yeah. And I, and I like how you've taken your team that you— so that you love just so I much because there you've even had some like I mean I know yeah. Nikki from the yes. beginning yeah but you took everybody to Zappos yes and you said hey look Zappos is doing something right that I like yes learn yes. what what happened there and how oh, did you even so find great. about it well we had this opportunity to to do customer service okay. you know what like no pharmaceutical company does well uh, customer service. No, you So get I look around and I'm like, well, shit, we can't learn from anybody in our industry. Let's go learn from the best. Mm -hmm. And so took the entire company out there. And it really shaped our thinking. Curiosity has been the key, right? Curiosity is everything to me. Uh, it tells me so much about a person in an interview and everything else. Like, how do you go continually learn from the best? Which I swear to God was born out of the fact that every time I asked my parents for help with my homework, they would say the same four words without fail. They would say, what do you think? Interesting. Which was infuriating. Like, just help me. I need an A. I want to win the science project, whatever it was. But my parents were never going to play into that. It was really about this cultivating curiosity. Because if they didn't give me the answer, I was going to have to go figure it out. I was probably going to get that answer from a bunch of different people and form my own opinion. And it created this real sort of independence and ownership that I think matters. Wait a second. So as like a almost new mom, yes, I'm I'm gonna need to take that in. <laughs> you do we so quickly like we are especially parents, right? Or I watch and observe. I get it. The temptation to be like here and let me help you with yeah, this and let me do give, that. Give, give. And of course, right? But at the same time, like what is the moment where you really kind of force that creative gene and that curiosity that's gonna take them so much further in life? Wow. So much further. Wow. Dropping knowledge <laughs> for the baby who's not even here. <laughs> a mentor. That's, yes. That's, that's all I'm going to oh, say. Now the next mentor? onesie is going to say, what do you think? Yes. I love that so much. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So like, oh God, now Cindy. I want to talk about Sprout. Yeah. I want to talk about Addy. Yeah. It's not, it's it, not Viagra. It's not. But I want to talk about how you started it. What yes. made you want to start Sprout? So I'd been in pharma. And explain Sprout. Yes. So Sprout has the FDA's first and only pill for the most common form of female sexual dysfunction. What is it? Mm -hmm. It's that we actually have no desire for sex. And this is not a issue down there for us. This is uh -uh. a mental issue. Totally in the brain. So desire turns on in the brain and from desire you get aroused and hopefully you orgasm and you know that's but everything gets started for mm -hmm. us in the brain. For me, it was very scientific. I'd built a company with one of the male sexual drugs. I built it. There were 26 of them for men, 26 different options. So you built a 27? <laughs> no, that I, mine was one of the 26. Okay, got it. So I'm, you know, building this company. I know the space really well. The researchers research women and men. And I'm going, how the hell is there not a single one for women? Despite the fact that the prevalence of this is the same as men having ED. Mm. But not a, not a drug for us. You know why? Because we say, oh, one doesn't matter if a woman is having satisfying sex. She can have sex whether or not it's pleasurable, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the second is, oh, it's not, it's all, it's just, just have a bath, just drink a glass of wine, just go on vacation. We chalk so much up to psychology that we will completely overlook biology in women. And I knew biologically that women who had this condition had a biological basis for it. And I knew it because there's brain scans that show that. So to me, again, everybody runs away 
not because the science wasn't spectacular, but because of a societal narrative that they know is going to stand in the way of progress. Because yet again, we're just the problem. Yeah. And we have a we say we have a problem, but nobody wants to fix it except for Cindy Eckert. <laughs> So, but how did you take Sprout yeah. and sell it for a billion dollars? Because that to me, I mean, I, you and I have sat yeah. down personally and yeah. you've told me about the, the, the woes of actually getting the oh. one billion. Yes. But can you tell everybody billion else? Billion up front. <sighs> um, <sighs> so it was actually an incredible path to break through with the first ever drug for female pleasure. And so it was crazy to go through this path and the path wasn't straight because the FDA turned us down. And then I disputed the FDA, so I fought the government. I fought the government because we had 13,000 women worth of data in which we had met our endpoints and double-blinded placebo-controlled trials, right? It's scientific to me. Um, And yet again, this narrative was keeping the blinders on. And when I won it, I think all of the big guys who would have never taken this on were like, holy shit, holy shit. Who the is this lady? The market opportunity is extraordinary, mm. right? So they Were you getting phone they, calls left and right at that oh, point? Oh, as, as, as soon as the signal was there that the FDA was going to prove, holy cow, they came calling. <laughs> they were at my doorstep. The minute I disputed the government, so rewind a little bit back, and here we are, this little company, you know, that nobody had ever heard of. Nightline showed up at the front door. Oh, are you kidding? They did. Because who is taking on the government for about female sexual pleasure? And what was so funny, I tell this story all the time, but the company was on the 10th floor of this building. And I had this great band of like, you know, the, the little company that could. And literally, right after Nightline shows up, like the next Monday, everybody's going up the elevators and people are like, I know what you do on the 10th floor now. <laughs> they were so freaked out. That's like, so Like, who cute. knew, right? Who knew? What was the first offer that you got money-wise? Oh, yeah. It was uh, $200 million. You were like, $200 million. Please. <laughs> Please. I will tell you this one. So there were three different parties that, that were really sort of um, all jockeying for it. And at the final, the one who became the victor gave a $900 million offer. And I said, well, that doesn't have a B on the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it with the laughter in your voice? <laughs> and click. Ah! Right, bye. <laughs> Peace. I was going to do it myself. I knew its value. Like the reality is I didn't pull a fast one. It was worth like the category for the ED drug. So same prevalence of condition as this condition for women. It's a five, six billion dollar category globally. This drug has extraordinary potential. So I wasn't going to have them get a bargain. Like, are you kidding? You're going to pay me a billion up front. And then pay me downstream. Wow. Yeah. But then but that then was what really happened? fun. I have to tell you, one of the offers. But the confidence. Came, the one of the offers came, and one of the most fun is they had flown down. The company's based in Raleigh. Like we were in some you know conference room at a hotel, and they were so proud they were going to make us this offer, and they very dramatically like made this offer. And they said, we're going we're gonna to let you all consider it. And I was in there with lawyers and everything else, and they walked out of the room, and I looked around the table, and I said, okay. They walk back in, five minutes, get up, walk out. And I had a big binder of like all our accolades, all our press, everything else. And so they came back in and I said, thank you very much. I'm so flattered by that offer. We're going to do it by ourselves. And we get up, like I'm looking at everybody like, get up, team, go. And my one lawyer is with me and she keeps going, the binder, the binder. I'm like, leave it, leave it, leave it. <laughs> and so what is she? we walked out and she's like, why did I leave the binder? I'm like, because it's going to make them call me back. And that's who called you back? And they called me back. And they're like, we have your binder. I'm like, oh, no, it's okay. You keep it. It's all for you. And they kept calling back. We should really give you the binder back. I knew the door was open and we were going to continue the conversation. It's all about strategy. Got to negotiate. You got to know what you have. And you got to be a little bit reluctant Mm -hmm. always, I think, to give it up. What does it feel like now to actually know that you got through this process and you did it by yourself? I... I don't, that's a, such a good question. I honestly think some, I haven't processed all of it. I woke up the next day. I sold it for a billion dollars. Everybody said, what happened? I woke up the next day. I'm still Cindy Eckert. Like, I still get up and go to work. It's what I love to do. And uh, my financial guy showed up not that long ago for a meeting in the office. <laughs> and he said, well, you live in the same house and you drive the same car. And he looks at me, he goes, and I'm pretty sure you were wearing that the last time I saw you. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so we're good. And I think, you know, you have more zeros in the bank account, but you still want to do the things that set you on fire. It's not like you saw the billion and you thought, oh, I'm going to retire and no. go buy an island Are somewhere. Are you kidding? I would be, that would be deadly. Like, <laughs> what the fuck would I be doing? There's too much work to be done. And and a long time ago, I think I decided my work is my hobby. My hobby is my work. I love what I do. Okay, I want to talk I get about to meet people like you. I know this is. I mean, thank God you didn't retire because I wouldn't <laughs> be getting the inside scoop on yeah. so many things. Let's talk about that that S word, sex. Yes. Let's talk about <laughs> sex, baby. I mean, you get to talk about it every day. I do. My publicist tells me to stop talking about it. Oh, no. <laughs> don't. Don't do it. It's always my secret. Every time I'm asked to quit an interview, like, what's your secret to this? What's your secret? Every time, universal answer, sex. Yeah. I mean, sex, sex like, is is very important part of, yeah. of anybody's life. And, yeah. you know, in my relationship, it's important. And I've talked yeah. about that openly. And, and I think that there's nothing wrong with talking about sex. Absolutely But not. I think the worst thing that we can do is not talk about it, especially when we're talking about HSSD. Yeah. Which I had no idea was was, was even a, a situation. Sure. Can you explain sure. what Addie actually does? Yeah. So, so for some women, they lose interest in having sex. They were once happy with it, something changed. And that change, to your point, is causing them a lot of distress. Like if it breaks down in the bedroom, it probably has broken down across the breakfast table. Mm. They're less connected. And by the way, even forget the partner dynamic, like they've lost their moxie of how they show up in the world. Mm. And so for that group of women, what we have learned is that there can be, your brain is basically working against you when it comes to sex. So we're very animalistic when we have sex. We need like this perfect balance of excitement and inhibition. And what our brain actually does is it, it shuts down. So if you watch on brain scan images, when people have sex, they sort of like, they turn everything off. Like, buy to-do list, buy this worry, buy work, whatever it may be, so that I can have sex. Well, I have to, to have like a really great orgasm. Right? right? You have to That's shut everybody. it down. Yeah. But for some women, they, they lose, because of an imbalance in the brain, they can't shut it down. And what they describe is they actually will say, like women with this condition will say, I'm lying in bed and I'm going, oh, I, I got to do this tomorrow. I got to do that mm. tomorrow. And I know we're all, we're busy, right? But they really, something has changed. They know it. The switch turned off. And so what Addie does is it works to restore the balance so that you're receptive again. Like you have that Bio, you know, biological drive you once did. And what it isn't is like, I'm going to pop a pill. I'm going to see a hot waiter and be like, you, me, let's go. Right. It's like fan all of a sudden women in our trials go, God, I had a fantasy. I can't remember the last time I had a fantasy. Wait, okay. So the symptom is actually called hypoactive sexual desire syndrome. Disor disorder. Disorder. Yes. yes. And how did you even find out about this It's symptom? been in the medical literature for for decades, for 30 years, 40 years. Set, it was first characterized in 1977. But nobody wanted to fix it. Correct. Did women, I mean, you were talking about this earlier. It was like, oh, go take a hot bath. Yes. Go have a glass of wine. Yes. What, Ugh. like, how did you even get into the sex no. world? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Irish Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> Actually, sex, scientifically, sex is so cool because we have learned so much. And actually medically, if we look at medical advances in the last couple decades, the biggest advance has been brain scan imaging. So for conditions that are affect the mind, the brain, like now all of a sudden we can see. So what do I mean? Take a woman with the normal ebb and flow of desire. Sometimes she's not in the mood, honey, not tonight, but like, you know, she's she likes her, their level of desire. Take a woman with HSDD, put them both in a MRI, expose them to some kind of erotic stimuli, their partner, porn, whatever it may be, brains light up totally differently, totally differently. So you see in these women that their brain isn't quieting to have sex. And for me, in black and white, science had already given us the answer. Like we knew that this was outside of her control. Mm. And the fact that what we were doing is saying, oh, my sexier lingerie, oh, read Fifty Shades of Grey, was so obnoxious to me. It's so dismissive of what we know scientifically. And then I got on my horse and rode, <laughs> right? <laughs> so no way are we going to let that be the, the state of the state for women. We're going to take it seriously. 
I'm sure a lot of women are praising your name right yeah. now, like Sandy, Sandy, hey <laughs> and yeah. partners. I oh hope. yeah. Well, you know that's because like it's other a thing. relief for them. The men who did not care about this drug. Yeah. It's like if you really cared about having sex so much, yeah. why do you care about the the you know the person you're having sex with? Yeah. What's funny is I just had a doctor describe it to me this way. She said she had put a patient on Addy. They walked back into her office and she said. And the minute she walked in, she's like, I knew it was working. Because she was just showing up different, right? She was back in that, you know, it's the sexual mental game. Because at, sexual first, feeling. Yeah. at first I thought, oh, Addie, it makes you wet, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's not about arousal. arousal. It's not about that. It's yeah. a mental mentality. And if I really yeah. think about the times where I just did not want to have sex, yeah. it was a mental thing. Sure. It wasn't. It wasn't because of what's happening below my belly button. It's that's right. Or I could just say vagina. <laughs> I don't right. have you to be PC. It, it is right. my podcast. Vagina. <laughs> <laughs> I think partially the reference that we were female Viagra, which the media like ran with, and it's delicious. Like two words. The context was right. This was a breakthrough for women, and for us to get many more options for our sexual, you know, d- dysfunctions in the bedroom if things go wrong, but. ED and Viagra is a mechanical, like, hydraulic lift issue. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. The truth is, if men don't have desire, Viagra won't work. Desire is the starting place. Desire, do you get aroused or erect? Do you orgasm? Like, when you study sex, you actually look at it that way. Desire, so you actually desire is what starts it. Start, you're fixing the, party, the first problem. Gets the party going. Um, so now you're a vocal advocate for women's rights to desire, yeah. which I had no idea was even something that you could be an advocate yeah. for. Can you explain yeah. what that what that all well, looks it's like? It's all born out of this, and I for me, it's we have a right to desire. We mm. have a. I mean, the World Health Organization says that sexual health is a basic human right, and it's really just taken on what I think is the last taboo. And for me, if I look at the conversation we have about women and sex, like we swirl around reproduction. Oh my God, we mm-hmm. go forward and backward mm-hmm. and forward and backward. And like my my theory is if we'd own it all the way through to pleasure, we'd actually finish all the nonsense. And women have to own it all the way through to pleasure. We have to own that right to desire because when we go into the bedroom, sometimes we go to make a baby. Mm-hmm. But I hope all the time we go for pleasure. Yes. And why the hell don't we talk about it? Why don't we have an honest conversation? We know by all the data how many women this affects, where they lose interest. Um, And it's important. Like, it's important to your sexual health that we're having the full conversation. It is important. When I talk to women, I have to tell you, the first time I had an event around it, um, a woman raised her hand at the end. She said, I guess I don't have a question. I have more of a comment. She said, until tonight... I think I never considered that I have a right to desire. Isn't that interesting? And it was so, I mean, it's exactly what this is all about. It's about why aren't we talking about this? Why is it the last taboo? And how do we just have, like, it's not a sensational conversation. It's just a evidence-based conversation. So that if your girlfriend looks at you and says, like, hey, um, not doing it anymore. Do you still do? And they're brave enough to bring that up. We don't pat her on the shoulder and say, it's just a phase. Mm. You'll pass. Because what you're doing is reinforcing this societal narrative that it doesn't really count. Like the answer is, hey, I'm like, hey, it can be a real thing. Like there are poss- it's possibly treatable. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't, but you should talk to somebody about it. Is this where you started the hashtag woman on top? Yes. And what is women? Wh- woman. Women on top. Women. women. Women on top. Yes. I mean, women on top for me is, you know, when I sold this business, here I am. The, one of the hardest moments is if you can do nothing or you could do everything. What do you do? And I had this opportunity to do something. And for me, it was about, I knew, having lived the incredible double standard of having a drug for men and, and trying to get a drug for women approved, Um, that my work going forward would be advocacy for women. Mm -hmm. And I was going to reach my hand back, and I was going to get other women there faster than I got there myself. And women on top is, like, literally, figuratively, like, you know, I'm known for getting female Viagra, so I like women on top in that way. But I also want women on top in business. Mm -hmm. Like, how the hell does 2%, 2% of all venture money go to women? Half the population has 2% of the good ideas, Ridiculous. It's not okay. And I didn't get money. When I showed up to raise money for female Viagra, they laughed me out of the room. How did you get the money? 
I went, I told every single person I would meet in any elevator or anything else what I was trying to do. And one conversation led to two friends who led to four friends who led to another circle. And my investor group is entirely made up of high net worth individuals and family offices. I never got venture money. What? I never got venture money. And I raised $100 million that way, which is, you know what? The path wasn't available to me, so I made a new path. This is my mentor, <laughs> Cindy Ecker. Just, just wanted to let you guys know that. Goals. It's crazy. That's insane. Which has then like become, you know, this secret weapon because now I get so excited and I invest in female entrepreneurs and the system yeah. is overlooking them right. and I go to this whole national network. I'm like, hey, I'm really excited about this. You should take a look. And I typically can help them raise all their money. And that kind of brings me to these all these crazy comments that you've heard. Yeah. Like, uh, what what do we need a bunch of horny women running around for? When that I read nice that starting comment. Point. Yes, that was my starting point. What do we need a bunch of horny women running around for? If that doesn't tell you everything in terms of our psychology on how much it actually matters. And and, and let me tell you this. I have been fortunate that thousands of women have told me their story. Back to the comments yeah. that you were hearing just, you know, about why would we want a bunch of horny women running around. What was that like? The can you imagine us saying that about men, by the way? Let me give a tale of two sexes. Yep. So Viagra went to the FDA, and guess what? They decided it met such an important unmet medical need that they fast-tracked its approval. It got approved in six months. That's if the pill was blue. If the pill is pink, six years. The double standard. And those comments say everything about really how we feel mm -hmm. about, you know, whether or not it matters if a woman is sexually satisfied. Why don't they want us sexually satisfied? I think it's terrifying. I think powerful women are terrifying to the fabric of society at large. I think a powerful woman completely in control of her, you know, sexual satisfaction pleasure is terrifying. And the, the reality is, like, the women who... I've talked to you over all of these years. They're, they love their partners. They're married. They've had. They've been dealing with this for. They've been married a long time. They may have been dealing with this for a long time. They really are happy with their partners, but this is going wrong, mm -hmm. and it's causing everything else to unravel. This isn't about like some kind of. It's so. It makes me irate that everybody thinks like, oh, it's a pill, and it's oh, you creating a bunch of nymphomaniacs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Uh, no, not how it works. <laughs> not never gonna happen. Um, oh, oh, I I love this that every man when I was going through this single at the time would say female Viagra. I'm female Viagra. Oh, <laughs> to which I would look at them after and I would say, oh, if I had a nickel for every time I'd heard that, I wouldn't have had to sell my company for a billion dollars. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That is a good one. Thanks. I want to talk now, like you you sold everything for a billion. You sold yes. this company for a billion. I did, yes. But now you have the pinkubator. I do. The pink ceiling. Yes. And what are you doing? Explain yeah. the pink ceiling for everybody. So uh, it's, you know, putting my money where my mouth is. I invest in companies buyer for women. We have a couple guys that are doing great stuff for women, mostly female founders. And it's the things that are the breakthroughs. Like the first, the things that everybody else is scared of and run away from. And really things that will take on, I think, important social change. So examples. We have this technology. We've talked about it a bunch where literally dip my finger in the drink, touch this disc. 30 seconds, it tells me if there's a date rape drug in that drink. That is so important. So important. Especially so important in on college campuses. Oh, my gosh. I have two nieces. One's still on a college campus. They can't get it there fast enough. Is this, are we, can we buy this yet? You can. It's called Sip Chip. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So literally, it's just a nail polish. You can put it on like your thumb or pinky or whatever. Disc. So you put it on a keychain or on the back of your phone, touch your finger, just literally a droplet of water on it. And, oh. it's, and it runs the test. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. What else are you excited about? Um, I'm excited about this flushable pregnancy test. Oh, that's interesting. Which again, the whole world sort of goes, walks away. You know, the classic like VCs are going, oh, I don't know, it's a niche market. You're like, really? A pregnancy test is a are niche you market? Fertility? It's a huge market. And it's so cool. This founder, her name is Bethany. Bethany and Anna are co founders. And, you know, she said, why does 80% of a pregnancy test today have to be plastic? 
And I love her reverence. Like, what the fuck? Why does it have to be that? Like, not in my world. Um, you know, she's very eco-conscious. And then what ended up happening is I think the conversation went, and why isn't it completely our discretion, how discreet that is? Like, why is it that every ad I see is only smiley so face when that's not always the desired outcome? And even to your point on, on fertility, like, think about compassionately an infertility patient who doesn't want to walk into her bathroom Open and up her be trash reminded can. that she's not pregnant again. I mean, it's just so cool. These are the kind of ideas that I look for who's innovating them. Is that product available right now, too? It's coming. Okay. It's coming. It's called Leah. Leah. L-I-A. 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 Yes. Oh, that's going to be a it's, great product. It's huge. I know that, like, the pregnancy uh, test companies are like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, shit. Because she's disruptive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so disruptive to need. that market. Yeah. I have um, I've called you, and I remember I was at a pool, and it was like a hot day, and we were, I was outside, and I was like, Cindy, I'm about to do a deal. Yeah. <laughs> and this company wants to give me, you know, they only want to give me 20%, and they want to give me a salary of whatever it was, but they're going to give me a certain percentage of the company. And you started just asking me questions. You didn't tell me what to do, mm -hmm. but you were this incredible mentor that oh. I needed to just hear from. Because... I have I have two teams that work with me, and in reality, we all really truly work together. But yeah. when you're in your own world, sure, it's one piece of advice you get. But yeah. then when I get to step outside of my world yeah. and talk to my mentor Cindy, yeah. it was like I got a whole new different perspective. And and you're really truly about female mentorship. Absolutely. And is are you doing a lot of that through the pink ceiling? I do. Or is it something that's also side? No, I, I do it through the pink ceiling. I mean, I'm I'm fortunate. I have the coolest job. People come to me every day with, you know, game-changing ideas or this desire to step up in a way. And so, like, that's what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. You know, having gotten to this outcome, this should not be a lonely club. <laughs> there should not be just a handful of women who sold a company for a billion dollars. That's bullshit. Um, and so my goal is, I, this is my favorite thing of building companies is this. Everybody who came worked for me was an owner. They had skin in the game. And when we got to these huge outcomes, they had transformational events. And that multiplier effect of ownership, I've watched how they've gone on, what their kids do now, how mm -hmm. they make decisions differently. And so really, it's like creating a pink army. How am I going to get other people to these big exits and they're going to pay it forward? And suddenly, it's the next group and the next group and the next group. And, you know, I look at a Bethany with Leah, and she will get to a big outcome. Mm -hmm. And she will bring the next woman there mm -hmm. right behind her. And that's what I'd love to do. That's fantastic. There's a quote that I love in your TED Talk. It's called, you say, empathy is the DNA of a female rule breaker. Yeah. What do you mean? So, look, I think there are all of these rules in society. And there are the rules of law and order that we all have to follow. And then there's all these unwritten rules. And the unwritten, there are many, many more unwritten rules for women. And I actually think that they get really pissed about something that's either affected them or others and that's when they start breaking all the rules. And they break all the rules that don't make sense. And it's informed entirely by empathy. It's about that feeling of the impact that they're going to have on others. And I really think, honestly, as I look forward to, you know, what does the C-suite look like moving forward in businesses? We manage everything to the spreadsheet. Everything is just to the spreadsheet. And you know what? The most important characteristic in a leader is going to be empathy. It will be that because they got to actually get through all the spreadsheets and just apply the human component to it. It's so true. Any Women are successful the, the woman I know, her whole story is behind the business or company that she has created yes. because she's been pissed off or she needed pissed to fill, fill the void, the issue. Yeah. It's the best kind of rule breakers. Wow. They, do it, they don't do it for the power, for the whatever. And I think if we look at some of the people, you know, in classical kind of CEO, if you imagine a picture of that, I don't know if you would under think that that was their motivation, but I would challenge you, just like you said, look at any sort of female well, and I mean, figure out that story why it, she got there. It makes there. sense because, like, I mean, I filled the void, you know, yes. with lingerie. I filled yep. the, like there's certain things I've seen even just for myself that yeah. I've gone. I'm like, oh no, I don't like that. Let's do this mm -hmm. instead. But it, and it works. Sure, fill the void for yes. something that you truly want in life. But yeah. in filling a void and being powerful and bold mm -hmm. and strong, you need money. 
Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you do. And you talk a lot Listen, about sex, money. I take it all on. Let's just How take on all the damn taboos. I've told this story honestly. Like after I sold this company for a billion dollars, a decade, like head down doing the work. I'd built, I'd built and sold the mail company. Then I built this company. I sold it, and all of a sudden, I'm getting these invitations to go out and speak. And I, a woman had seen me a couple times, and she came up to me and she said. I love that you never say how much you sold your business for. And literally the next time I got on stage, I said, hi, I'm Cindy Eckert, and I sold my last company for a billion dollars. Because I knew, like, what am I? I'm playing into this, like, taboo of women talking about money. You know, money is a currency to do a lot of good. And we talk about this, women need a voice. Women don't need a voice, they need power. And money is that power. Money is a power to make the decisions about the things I want to see in this world. And when I get to sit on this side of the table, then I get to invest in the things that everybody else said was just a niche market and didn't really matter. Power. You got to talk about the billions, baby. (laughs) (laughs) Sex, billions. I mean, can we write a show around you? Sex, (laughs) drugs, and a billion dollars. (laughs) Wait, you've said that before, and I hope that you're working on that book. <laughs> I'm not, but I need to. Cindy. Okay, copyright. What do yeah. I say there now? Like, trademark. Trademark, <laughs> right there. Okay, so talk about being bold and yeah. underestimated and, and being fearless a lot, but I want to know yeah. what was your boldest move you ever made in your life? And it, it can be even beyond career. I don't yeah. know. I got to tell you, it's hard to top taking on the government. <laughs> Honestly, like, I don't know. You wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to dispute the government. It's funny. I got this decision that they weren't going to approve the drug. And the decision was, it it didn't make sense based on all of the data. And so I get this decision. And I literally had to go into the company and tell everybody that we thought, I was blindsided. Like, we'd done all the work. We'd met all the goals. What? And, um, And I can remember, like, telling the whole company And everybody looking at me like, oh, shit, well, this is it. You know, we're going home. It was a Friday. Like, we're going home and working on our resumes. Because I had no recourse. It's the government. And they make the decision. And literally, I went home. I cried it out. I woke up the next day. I went back to my inbox. And I started reading all the letters that women were writing me. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for letting me know I'm not alone. Keep the faith. And then one popped up. And she said, I know what's going on. I was in your trials. I have to tell you my story. And so I went to meet with her, and um, and she came in, and I've told this story a million times, but it was such a huge moment for me because I could see her coming a mile away, in charge, type A, walking in, and she said, you know, she had a beautiful boy, she ran her own company, and she looked at me, she had this condition, she said, I've succeeded in every aspect of my life other than this. And for me, I said, that's it. Like, that's the portrait of a woman. She's raised her hand a thousand times and said, something's different, something's wrong, something's changed. And she'd been patted on the shoulder and dismissed. And um, and we were just marginalizing what was going on for her. So I said, can I show you something? And I literally pop open and start showing her the brain scans because I'm such a geek. And when I'm doing this, she's like left the conversation and she's crying. And in that minute, I decided, that's it. That's why I'm doing this. I went in on Monday morning, I told the company, I'm gonna dispute the FDA. And they were like, really? (laughs) I call it the road less traveled, Um, but that was bold. I was gonna take them on, and I was gonna take them on because of that woman. Because that's why we were doing it, and we had data in 13,000 of her, and we were getting in our own way of looking at the scientific answer because of all of the narrative around female sexuality. Wow, that's awesome. And and you've had to fight against so many different men. Oh, yeah. And I think that there's a lot of women out there that want to know how, when in, in this advocacy for yeah. women, how do you fight against the man and the power? Yeah. And, and what's your advice to them? I think you got to, you know, own the competence. Mm -hmm. You got this. You know it. Like, I would walk into these rooms, and I anticipated. I didn't look the part. I'm showing up in hot pink. I'm talking about women (laughs) and sex, right? Like, if you say, if pharmaceutical CEOs sold their last business for a billion dollars, I do not come to mind. And I think at some point, actually anticipating it was my weapon. 
because I knew knew that they were going to underestimate me and I was going to fucking kill it with competence because I knew my stuff and I knew it better than any one of them. And I could go toe to toe on any of it. And it kind of became the gamification of it. Like, oh, watch this. Right? this the, it's really fun. And I think for all women, I talk to female entrepreneurs about this a lot, is um, leverage the element of surprise. Mm. If you actually have the expectation, you don't, you're not surprised if somebody doesn't take you seriously, is underestimating you, um, which will make you like either get frustrated or whatever it may be, or you'll start to doubt yourself. And you can't let that happen. Mm-hmm. You can't let that happen. Know, let, every, let know everything. Somebody. Absolutely. Before you walk in. And be and don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. Laugh at, like, it's, it's funny because you're about to surprise them. Like, <laughs> have, have a little bit of fun with it. I love the guys who, like, absolutely laughed me out of the room and now call me up and they're like, hey, Cindy, can I get into that deal? And like, there has to be a little bit of pain before I let them in, but of course they can get on the deal because that's change. Like, they're not bad. They weren't bad guys. Right. They just had blinders on. And I gave them a billion reasons to believe. Literally. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up wearing pink yes. in these uh, <laughs> these meetings yeah. because this is your uniform. It is. I've never not seen you have a pink shirt, dress, Except pants. Except when you put me in a bra and jeans. Exactly. <laughs> it wasn't a pink bra. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> How important is yeah. the persona of who you are on the outside a part of your brand and how, and how does yeah. that how does that play into the pink ceiling? So pink for me is irreverent. Pink is surprise because we have so many associations with pink, right? Mm -hmm. It's weak. It's this. It's whatever. It's fluffy. Um, And really what happened is when I was going through with what was called the little pink pill, people would say, oh, that's so cute. Oh. And when they said that, I thought, oh, no. And I started showing up in this color at meetings at the FDA in the audience like, hi. I guess what we're going to talk about today. And so I really think it's a choice. I love pink, by the way. Like, if you go back in my childhood, I can't find a picture when I'm not in pink. So it's really? authentically. Oh, so it's been you since love, day one. Love it. Love pink. Love embracing the femininity of it. Never thought I should change that to be more masculine, to succeed in a man's world. Bullshit. Um, and I think that the pink really was that shift um, in the discussion around the pink pill from underestimated to unapologetic. Like, we have so many gender stereotypes, and I think what happens is we run away, like, to try to prove, like, we're not that, we're not weak, we're not this. And actually, the different decision is just go right for it, because that's what you should be talking about. That's so interesting. Own it. Own it, honey. And then here you are, you're wearing pink, you've yes. got a pink pill, you've got a pink company, and people are buying into it. I don't have a pink car. <laughs> you don't? No, I know. What's it's so disappointing. You? I know. But you do have pink pigs. I do. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Which is like a fun you. little, you know, yes. tidbit about That's Miss right. Cindy. <laughs> I know. I have a I have a picture when you walk into our office that we like graffitied and it was cowboys scrape shit from your boots before entering. Which is like I, just funny to me for some reason. Once upon a time, it went at the back door of my little company when I first started my first startup. And now it says cowgirl scrape shit from your boots. And I think it is about like that groundedness, right? The pigs for me, like I still got to scrape shit from my boots when I come in from uh, spending time with them. And I think that's important. It's all about hard work. It is. It's about hard work. It's about making sure that you don't give up on yourself. Ever. Ever. And it's it's about asking for help. Yes. And knowing that your no's can always turn into yes's. Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. You, I think people would be surprised if they just asked how many people would say yes to helping them. I think we're scared to ask often. Mm. I think it's an imposition or whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. They go in with a really specific, I get, really, I got an, an asked the other day on Instagram, like somebody DM'd me and said, I really want to come work for you. I said, great, send me your resume. She works for me now in New York City. What's your Instagram again? For <laughs> At Cindy Pink CEO. There you go, guys. You can DM Cindy. There you She'll go. write you back. That's right. Okay, so something I like to do at yes. the end of every Pretty Big Deal episode is a fill in the blank. It's our Ooh. it's our lightning round. Love it. Okay. Okay, so you fill in the blank. I pretty much always drink iced tea. <laughs> you are a Southern girl. I, I love it. I'm a far enough South that it could always get it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the biggest lesson you've learned in the past year? To be open to love. 
Oh, and Cindy's engaged. Hi. Um, what's the biggest deal you've ever made? I mean, I know it's hard to not say that. Yeah. Yeah. You made a billion, billion dollars. Dollar deal. <laughs> I mean, hello, that's a pretty big deal, girl. Okay, so obviously you're a pretty big deal, but I want to know what is a pretty big deal to you? A pretty big deal to me is that women find a way to own it. Find a way to own a piece of the value that you're creating in this world, however mm. it is. That's a really, that's a pretty big deal to me. Wow. And I feel like when you just said that to me, it wasn't just about financial, but it was also yeah, emotional. It is. Wow. That's good. Own it. Cindy, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for joining us on Pretty Big Deal here with Cindy Eckert. And you can go on Instagram and Twitter at Pretty Big Deal Pod. Make sure you write us all your comments and questions because we're going to be getting into them. Thanks for listening, guys.